Hey, everybody. Uh, so I'm Kelly Parks, certified professional bookkeeper up here in Canada. But I do a lot of um, fooling around in the States as well, either spending time down there or working with accountants, bookkeepers, app partners, and and end user clients in the United States. And um, I'm meeting today with John Ree. Is it Ree or Rhea? Ray. Hey, John Ray of Scrutinize. Tell us a little bit about yourself, John. Hi, so I'm John, uh, CEO, founder of Scrutinize, and what is now Scrutinize, which is a quality control tool for bookkeepers to quickly find any kind of like integration errors, clerical errors, things like that in their books. Uh, what is now Scrutinize began as an internal tool that I built when I was running my own fractional CFO and bookkeeping firm uh, here in Austin, Texas. And as we grew, especially the bookkeeping segment, uh, we found that we needed, you know, a little bit of extra assistance to rigorously and systematically check for, you know, certain patterns and conditions. And so uh, built out, you know, V1, V0.1 of Scrutinize, and then uh, started talking with other bookkeepers and other practitioners and, uh, you know, got the sense that it would be valuable for them as well. So spun it into its own company and now it's uh, it's, its own separate thing. So, Okay, cool. And who's the other John Ray? The other John Ray. And the other John Ray who's recording it. I'm not sure if that shows up in the recording or not, but that's fun that we've got the other John Ray. So John is transcribing the, the call, which is cool. I always love to see some of these other apps other than the app that we're going to talk about. Um, so there is one. What are you, what are you using? It's Fathom. Oh, this is video. Fathom. No, yeah. yeah, note taking. Okay. Yeah. So that's fun. Tanya Hiltz gave me her Fathom code. So I signed up for it because it just auto takes notes and then records the sessions. So. Okay, that's cool. That's fun. Yeah. Okay, so um, you represent Scrutinize, but you have a background in accounting. Yep. And you like apps, technology. Love, love technology. Love apps. Yep. Okay, so what are your three, two or three favorite apps? And they don't have to be business ones, but go ahead if they are. Sure. Uh, I'd say that the two that I, I interact with a lot is uh, one is Figma. So I'm not a designer. I don't hold myself out to be a designer or like, you know, the ability to like make pretty things, you know, by hand is not sort of ingrained in me, but Figma allows me to kind of create pretty things just very easily that I could show as proof of concepts to other, other people or, you know, people inside the company to kind of get whatever's in here onto something that I can share. So Figma is a good one. I find it really easy to use. Uh, and then the other one that I probably couldn't live without is Calendly. So uh, just, you know, the ability to expose your calendar to uh, tons of people, but then also have the control of like, I only want to do this type of meeting in this time of day and for, you know, this amount of time. And so like, that's a, that's a big one, at least from, you know, managing my schedule and making sure that it's all organized. Hey, Harp, and I mean Harp endlessly on an online scheduler it's like one of the things that I just don't know how people live without and the pushback on it astounds me but I think anybody who's ever had one doesn't even know how they live mine is acuity it doesn't matter which one it is they're all pretty great and there's a ton of them I'm with you yeah an online scheduler is a game changer right yeah yeah I've never uh I never understood why people get mad when you send them like the link I love when people send me a calendar link it's like great now I can just Go through and select the time that works best for me, right? Get it done. Do you ever play the game though? I try to get my calendar link out first so that <laughs> I don't have to look on my calendar to use somebody's calendar link. I, I, I like to like I like to hit, hit it up with mine. No, no, you go find a time that works. But anyways, now we're just getting off topic, which is you know one of my specialties, right? <laughs> and you are a new dad, right? About to be, yeah. It's mid-April-ish. So it's coming quick. Um, right. yeah, getting the nursery ready, getting, getting everything painted and out and dried before the baby comes. So fun, it's exciting. And you and I met in real life a couple of times now. I know for sure it's zero con. We met at zero did con. We, we met at accounting we web. Accounting web live summit. That's it. Accounting web in San Diego. Right. We met at accounting web, uh, in the gym unbeknownst to each other. And hey. uh, I was hogging the barbells and you, you were, were like, hogging hey. the barbells or the, yes. the dumbbells. <laughs> and, uh, and then later on, we kind of had this moment of like, were you that person at the gym? So, so. Uh, because you and I had already been talking on social, we're in tax Twitter together. 
yep. uh, were in some other groups. So I already knew you on social, but yeah, I had, I had the cap on and you, I was head down and you were working away and it was only maybe two hours later that we went, that was fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And so you've been very low key about scrutinize. So I was at two conferences with you and I knew you had scrutinize and then I started to hear about it from some of my peers, colleagues uh, that are in our tax Twitter world. If you're not on tax Twitter, don't you think everybody should be on tax Twitter? I do. I mean, it's it's for the camaraderie alone, let alone yes. like the, the light bulb moments that you have from seeing how other people do things or their, yeah. their perspectives. But just just the uh, down in the trenches with other people kind of feeling that you get is is worth it for sure. And so I started some chatter about scrutinize and then um, things kind of, kind of came to a being for me in that I'm really starting to look for, uh, I have a file review process and um, I, I do have some, well, I've got a process. Um, I'm using QuickBooks file review in the background right now, but as I told you, I'm on the hunt, I'm on the prowl. And uh, funny enough, another friend of mine sent me a note and he was on the prowl too. And so I am totally hoping that he's going to be, well, I'm going to send him this video afterwards. <laughs> um, and then I finally sent you a note and said, just give me, give me a quick and dirty on it. And then I'm like, once you showed me the very basics of it, I think that's when I decided I need to see this app actually in action. And then here we are, right? Yep. Yep. And so... Uh, for anybody out there, which is probably everybody who doesn't know me, um, I work with app partners in the accounting space, um, backup security apps, um, uh, general ledger apps, uh, document management like Dext, practice management like Financial Sense. There's a whole bunch of them that I work with. And you have to fill out quite an exhaustive form to get to this stage with me. Did you feel the form was exhaustive, John? I felt like it was it was good practice to uh, kind of go through and and really um, explicitly think about all the different areas of the business that you might, as an owner or operator or whatever, you just kind of take for granted. But when somebody asks you in a forum, you kind of go, huh, what is the, how do I feel about that? Yeah, because in order to get to this stage with me, where I actually do a one-to-many demo and invite you into some of the things, you you got to pass some milestones in that form. And sure. so far, so good on your app. You you I loved some of the things that you had in there. You're certainly working your way through the security part of it, and you're working your way through you're going to be viable in a couple of years. We don't want our apps to come and go. Yep. Um, all of that kind of stuff. So that was fun. Um, and so let's you are in the United States, your product. Yep. So we're based in Austin, Texas, primarily. We're a remote first team, though. So we're we're we all happen to be mostly in Austin, but we're sort of agnostic as to where we um, hire people, as long as they're good people and and fit the team. And you're on Amazon Web Services, built on Amazon Web Services. Yeah. So we we architect everything um, on Amazon infrastructure for a couple of reasons. One, it's really easy to manage, uh, as you could expect. You know, having a uh, run all of that different infrastructure yourself or splitting it across different providers gets, you know, really difficult. The second is that uh, in a certain way, you kind of get to inherit the best practices and security practices that Amazon has. If you set everything up right, which, um, you know, our, our engineers have taken lots of time to make sure we did. So things like encryption in transit, encryption at rest of the data uh, in the data centers, um, other kinds of standards that they follow, you know, and best practices, we we kind of inherit that. And then they've got who knows how many people on their security team that are actively continuously improving, you know, their products. So uh, yeah, we like to offload as much as possible onto that infrastructure layer. It is housed in the US? Yep, everything is housed uh, in the US, uh, somewhere in, a, in Virginia, it's, it's the US East one is the server farm we use, so single sign on with Intuit and who else? Intuit zero and zero? Yep. So you could log in using your Intuit or zero credentials, or you could create an account, you know, directly using um, the sign up, sign up form that we have, which is behind the scenes provided by an Amazon, again, another Amazon service called Cognito. Uh, cool. 
And so you integrate, and then we'll get to what you do. Sure. But you integrate with both Zero and QuickBooks Online. Correct. Yep. So we have direct integrations with QBO and Zero, and then we also have the ability for people to export files from Des QB Desktop or QuickBooks Online and upload them securely and get a similar level of analysis um, as, okay, cool. as you'll see. So. Right, right. Um, good to know. And then uh, one-way or two-way sync with the direct integrations? So with QuickBooks, it's a two-way sync. Uh, with Zero, it's still kind of like more of a read-only. So we pull the data and we give you the analysis. Um, but we don't have that ability like you do with the direct QuickBooks integration um, feature that we have to update the information and sync it back to the ledger to remediate any issues that you find. And so now that we've gone through all of that, what does your app do? I mean, I already know, but let's <laughs> yeah. let other people know what would be the three big use case scenarios of your app. Yep. So uh, I'd say there's, there's really kind of two buckets that I like to put it in. The first is when you're scoping uh, a new engagement or a new client, uh, you know, you really want to get your hands around what might be wrong with the books and use that to inform the scope and the price of any kind of cleanup. And then also have some kind of sense of what that steady state engagement is going to be. Again, both from a pricing standpoint, but also from capacity planning, like does my team have the capacity to handle this file? So what we do on that side is, you know, basically pull all the data and then present it to you in a way that allows you to use what I like to call like mathify. You get to kind of mathify your scoping and proposal process by having some level of support for the number that you eventually give the client in terms of pricing. The second big bucket is either on a monthly or whatever that recurring basis is, quarterly, annual uh, review. Um, it's a tool that allows you to go in, very quickly connect a client file, find and fix any issues. And then in addition to that kind of workflow around um, you know, diving in and fixing things, you get some other kind of what we call metadata around things like the state of the union of the books. So customer, vendor utilization, things like that. Other, other areas that you might wanna uh, know about, but aren't necessarily anomalous. So some, which, What's one of the things, well, you and I talked about it when you were doing the mini demo for me. It's nice to have some of the non-posting things show up as well. But as you mentioned, like the, whether things have not been utilized. Yeah. Right. So it's not just, are they posted to the right category? It's like, have they even used that account? Yep. Yeah. We have three kind of buckets. We put things in on that side. The first is what we call anomalies or flag transactions. And the idea is that they've, the transaction line itself. So we go line by line through the ledger period. Um, and the line itself has met some so sort of criteria with 26 different patterns we look for. Some sort of criteria that says, hey, flag this and then tell the user, you know, what we were looking for, what we found and why it's an issue and, and then suggest some kind of remediation, you know, potentially for that. So that's kind of like the anomaly flagging. Then we have these other things that we call insights, which is more like what you're talking about. So it's a, it's other things that aren't necessarily anomalous. It's things like transaction volumes, customer vendor usage, chart of accounts usage, user activity. Um, they give you some insights around, you know, the the state of the union, but also how people are using these this set of books. And then the third is what I like to call the sniff test reports. So we pull APA our aging and a balance sheet and PL variance report to give you a sense of okay, I've gone through the fine tooth comb. Does, do these financial statements now make sense You know, from a top-down kind of perspective? Is there still any kind of chunkiness that I need to be double-clicking on and, and uh, aware of? So. Okay, cool. So we're going to get into a demo in a, in a second, but just so that anybody um, who watches the video knows it's not just John hanging out in his basement building an app. Uh, you've got some app partners, and I thought it was interesting, uh, two of your partners or, or whatever. Tell me about your team a little bit, including uh, the interesting of how you met the one guy. Yeah, so um, the V1 of Scrutinize was built, the V0.1 was, was essentially built by me. I don't hold myself out to be a developer. Um, and so when I uh, when I published it to the web with this you know, initial app and started showing people stuff, uh, it immediately broke. And because I'm not a developer, I didn't really understand like why it was breaking. So we're fixing your I, own problem. Do what? 
you were fixing your own problem to begin with. Yeah. So I was fixing my own. So the, the, the very earliest version was just a, so, you know, software that I ran on my, on my actual machine. And then when I kind of pushed it into the browser, you know, so other people could use it, uh, something was just happening and it was just a white screen. Um, and so I was like, I don't understand this. So anyway, fast forward, I, uh, you know, the whole front end was built in a technology called React. So I got into the Slack of one of my clients, uh, Slack channels, and there was a guy that I, I knew from, from um, you know, interacting with that client, going to various offsites and things like that. And I said, hey, is anybody Moonlight on React development? And he was like, hey, I, you know, I can help. And also, uh, I'm in a band with a guy named Jack, who's also uh, learning, um, you know, engineering and programming. And, you know, he could come on board and this would be like a really great project for him as well. And so uh, we brought you got the bass. You got the bass player. And I never did see what the other instrument was, the bass player and the uh, pianist. Yeah, Zach, uh, uh, Jack is like kind of almost virtuosic uh, in when it comes to like piano. And I have a separate thesis that I won't go into too deep, but there's a huge overlap between good developers and musicians. And that's 100%. something that I'm super bullish on. Um, if somebody comes into our pipeline and they say, Hey, well, I'm a musician. It's like, they kind of get ranked higher because, because <laughs> it's worth okay, so it. It's a scrutinized band. Okay. He's got a yeah. couple of developers yeah. and then you've got a couple of people doing some admin work. You've got a bookkeeper. Yay. You've yep. got some marketing stuff going on. So the bottom line in, it's not John hanging out in his basement, hoping this flies. You've got no. a team. No, there's yep. about seven of us in all in all that are, that are moving the, pushing the train forward. So. Do you want to give us a demo? Yeah, I would love to. Okay, great. Share my screen here. All right. So when you first log into Scrutinize, uh, this is the client segmentation area. And I've already got a couple of kind of dummy clients set up in here. But if you were to add, you know, need to add a new client, you just click this button up here, go through the flow and it'll pop you right into um, that new client that you set up. We'll go into a, an existing one. So that's the typical integration that we see with Xero and QuickBooks, Auth authorize it, just go through those steps and then away you go, right? I'm guessing. Yep, so if you um, if you go back to um, the login screen, so this is like the, the main login screen. If you set up your account using um, Intuit or Xero, um, you could just click that and it'll OAuth and use the credentials that you've got set up. If you've got MFA turned on for either of those accounts, then it'll take you through that flow. We don't have we don't currently have MFA fully live if you create an, a, a a direct account with us, but in probably the next two or three weeks, uh, that'll be live as well. So oh, great. We'll sign in using into it here. All right, great. So yeah, so once you land in the app, you're taken to this client segmentation area. Uh, and the main thing that we'll do is go into a client that we've got set up. And the primary call to action is to run a new report. And like I mentioned earlier, um, there are kind of two main reasons you might want to run a report. Maybe you're scoping a new client uh, or a new prospect and you want to kind of get your hands around what's wrong with you know the books and what a steady state look like. Or you're doing a recurring um, uh, quality review of some kind, either monthly, quarterly, whatever that looks like. Uh, and I'll get into some of the different data elements that you could use in either of those workflows here shortly. But first, we'll run the report. So when you click New Report, uh, you select your data source first. So is this a you know, direct integration with QBO, direct integration with Zero for this client? Or sometimes you've got you know, a situation where the client hasn't given you credentials uh, or you're, they're a prospect, but they don't want to tell their current bookkeeper they're looking. And so- right. You could get them to send you um, certain files, basically the ledger, account vendor, and customer list, and export those from either uh, desktop or QBO, QB desktop or QBO, and then upload those and get a similar level of analysis here. Um, so that's something okay, that- Super useful, great. Yeah, we, we see that used quite a bit uh, in the scoping workflow that, that people run. We'll use the QBO integration. This next screen is really where you start to tweak the knobs and the dials of what you're looking for. So as I mentioned, we've got about 26 different patterns that we look for under the quote unquote anomaly category. Uh, we've got some of these financial reports that we pull in, and then we've got this other metadata. 
as you get to know the app and, and as you get to know really what is important for the client that you're, you're inspecting, you could turn categorically these on or off to just sort of reduce the noise and say, hey, I don't really care about, you know, seeing this category because for this specific client, you know, or this group of clients, that doesn't matter to me as much. The other thing that you could do is you could say, hey, I actually, I do want to see the credits to expense accounts, but I don't want to see anything under $100. So okay, you know, don't show me kind of filtering on that threshold level. And you could save that combination of thresholds and then categories being turned on or off as a template that you can reuse globally. So if you went into another client and you've got maybe one you, you set up for all your SaaS clients or all your CPG clients, you could go into another client that's also a SaaS company. And when you run the report, you could select it from the dropdown and then use that same template as well. Okay, great. Okay. I'll leave them all on now just because it's helpful to get the breadth of what we're doing. Now you select your date range. There is no maximum. So especially when I was scoping clients, you know, I'd throw it pretty wide. I want like as much data as possible, especially if I'm doing a cleanup to be able to scope the scale of that cleanup, but then also get a sense of over time, how have the books changed? How's the transaction volume, you know, changed um, in these books over time? Um, we'll run it for a year here though. And you kick it off. So the important thing is like, if you run it over a couple hundred transactions, it could take 10 or 15 seconds. If you run it over 10,000 transactions, it might take a little bit longer. At any time though, you can go and start a report for other clients. Uh, and then when it's done uh, doing its thing, you'll get a lo little notification here that says like the report that you ran is complete and you can navigate back and, and look at that. So we've got that. That's great, it's complete. We'll go into the a previous one here. Did you say the prettiest one? The, pre the previous one. <laughs> also you the said prettiest. the prettiest one. <laughs> Yeah. Um, when you first click into the report that you've run, if you've directly integrated with QuickBooks Online, we take you to this, what we call the anomaly resolution queue. And so the idea here is that if you want to dive right in and start cleaning things up that, that were found inside of that period, um, you could do so using this queue. And this is a list of every transaction that was flagged as having one or more things out of that list of 26 as potentially wrong or anomalous about it. And you could click in, you could hover over and say, you know, say like, what's wrong with it? And kind of get this little tool tip. Um, but you can also open the transaction right in here and that'll open the full kind of modal here for you. When you scroll down, this is all the, it should look pretty similar, you know, to the, the QBO interface at least. When you scroll down, it'll have the list of everything that was flagged under here. And for each one that you click, it'll tell you a little bit about, hey, what does this mean? Why is this even an issue? And then what might I do to go ahead and remediate this issue? You know, should I care to? So in this case, it's saying it's an inconsistently coded vendor, which is a classic thing that happens. Sometimes it's normal. Sometimes it's, you know, somebody with a little bit of a too quick of a finger is like clicking and accepting in the bank feed. Um, so I come up here and maybe I know that Robertson Associates is, um, is actually, you know, a bookkeeper. And I see down here, they're charged to, you know, accounting, but then they're charged a lawyer here and they're charged a lawyer here. Well, I can go ahead and open this up, select the right GL account here that's pulled in whenever you connect that client file and then save that. And then if I wanted to go to that other one that is still lawyer, I could click through to that transaction as well and go, yep, this actually needs to be bookkeeper as well. Save that. And then what that does is it stages, but hasn't synced those changes yet. So the idea is that all of those uh, changes that you're making are kind of getting staged behind the scenes. And if you ever wanna kind of come look at them, they're in this resolved tab. And you could tell they're staged two ways. One, it says you haven't synced these changes. And then you've got this little gray icon here that says, um, you know, hasn't been pushed back to QuickBooks. Whenever you're ready and you've worked through them all, you could sync it back to the ledger. And then, you know, depending on its success, it'll give you like a little green icon here. So, you know, like good, the change was made. If you go into QuickBooks now, these are both updated with your updates. If for whatever reason, and, you know, sometimes QuickBooks just doesn't like it. It's like, it's, it was a duplicate or something happened uh, and it gets rejected. It'll get bumped back to your for review queue with a little red icon and a little bit of information about why. So that's I, if so, I would, go ahead. 
I'm just curious on the syncing. Do you have to have QuickBooks open and do you have to have the same client file open for it to sync over? Nope. So what happens is when you set up that integration for that client, when you ran this report, we're yep. basically saving that behind the scenes, that link. And then you don't have to have any other tabs open. Whatever, whatever you're doing in here, you could just have scrutinize open, um, updating everything. And then when you uh, click sync, it'll just make an API call to go update that in QuickBooks. Okay. Yep. So that's the, I found something and I actually want to fix it kind of workflow. But there are other things that you might review and you, you don't want to take any action on. You go, I'm glad I looked at it. That's fine. Um, but I don't want to take an action on it. Um, and so for those, we do what's called marked as reviewed. So let me, I'll put this back here. So let's say I was going to look at this payment that got made. I could open it up and say, okay, the only thing that got flagged is that it's an unreconciled bank transaction. That's fine. I know I'm going to capture that when I go walk through my reconciliations and walk them forward. Mark that as reviewed. And now it's basically said, okay, I've taken it out of your for review queue. I put it in this other list that says I looked at it, but didn't want to take an action. Um, and those are kind of the, the two main actions that you could take here, either update and sync it back or get it out of your queue. You know that from the anomaly thing that it was unreconciled, right? Correct. Like went over on, on that right-hand side. You can see that when you hover. You can see that when you hover. And then you so could can also- can you get rid of it without opening it? Yep. Well, you can- um, you can open the transaction here or you can click it here and click mark as reviewed. So if you hover over there- getting at, if it's just unreconciled and the date is fine, you know that that's carried forward. You don't have to open it to do anything, right? You Correct. Can, yeah. Right. Okay, okay. This bill payment, this is the only thing that was flagged there. Go ahead and mark that as reviewed. Get it out of my queue. Um, can you mark several things as reviewed at the same time? Yeah, you can bulk bulk mark everything as reviewed if you, if you care to. And where that really comes in handy is- Let's say I'm, I want to sort categorically and I want to say only show me all of the transactions, you know, that are, um, let's say, missing checks. So these would be gaps in the check register. So they're not right. actual transactions. They're just gaps in whatever register exists in QBO. So you might look at these and go, you know, now there's a bunch because I manually created these. So this is pretty egregious, but you, there might only be two uh, or three or four. And you could just bulk select them all and go, OK, I reviewed them all. Get them out of my queue. Um, and then the last thing before I move on is that, uh, you know, you, you've always got the case where you accidentally click something and you're like, oh God, now what, what happened in QuickBooks? Where do I go to like fix this? So anything that you do, whether Mark is reviewed or let's say you've already staged and synced a change, you can undo that change and it'll put it back to its original state in QBO. So the, the initial state, you know, when we ran the report. Um, and then that transaction will go back in your for review queue. So if you accidentally click something or somebody gets a little click happy in here, you can put it back. Okay. And this is the main find and fix workflow. The way I like to kind of talk about this is that the initial review we recommend is done by the person closest to the books. So sometimes that's the junior person. Sometimes depending on how you've got your team structured, you know, it could be somebody else, but the person with the most context to decide, was this an oopsie? Um, should be coming in here and finding and fixing any kind of like clerical errors that they accidentally made first. What's left then in this in this queue is usually after I fixed any kind of like accidental issues is usually related to I've got a process breakdown, I've got a client communication breakdown, or I've got a training gap. And in that case, those are, I would consider them all actually things that it's your manager's job to help you solve. And so in that case, you would come through, the junior kind of does their own self audit, fixes what they can. And the rest right. of the things that might be in this queue are a conversation point to go, hey, look, I don't have the context that I need to treat this transaction correctly. So I can't move it out of uncategorized income because I don't know what it is. Or, right. hey, I've got a training gap. I don't quite understand accrual accounting yet. And so this got flagged. Can you walk me back through how we journal you know, things out of accrued expense or whatever that is. Um, and that's kind of the more long-term ROI on the quality review piece is how do I find the the training gaps or the process breakdowns upstream so that I don't have to play whack-a-mole every month figuring out that Dave doesn't understand fully accrual accounting and I need to give him a little extra love. Any questions on that piece before I move on? I think so. 
So the next section is really where we kind of get into what I call state of the union data, some metadata around what's going on in these set of books. And this can be helpful as well when you're going through that uh, quality review monthly, but a lot of this stuff is really helpful from scoping cleanups and kind of getting a sense of what might be wrong with the books when you're prospecting. Where I always started, uh, because we were a fixed fee firm, was I would go look at the, the transaction volume first. And I'd say, what kind of volume and complexity am I dealing with and across what types of transactions? So I get a sense of, uh, you know, informing the scope and the price that you know I'm ultimately going to give this client. A couple of tools that we can use for that are the transaction by type table. So we can click in here and what this is saying is here's a list of every transaction type that was present inside of whatever every period you ran, as well as the aggregate amount impact, the count of the transactions themselves, and then importantly, the line items. Yeah. Yeah. So do I have 50 invoices that I'm putting in with one line item each, or do I have 50 invoices that I'm putting in with 50 line items? It's a different amount of work that I'm going to have to, you know, expect. Let's you say know I'm also that, but that's such a good point because I see people price files based strictly on transaction volume. One of my bigger engagements actually had very low volume. And um, because every every single transaction had some sort of complexity to it. Hmm. And then I had a huge volume client that um, largely it was being brought in by POS systems. That okay. was one of my lower touch engagements. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I like, it's, like the line item things. thing. That's a great start. It's a, yeah, it's a good place. And we also have like a um, part of our roadmap is building out a, a more discrete kind of scoping tool where you'll be able to kind of configure what your cost structure internally is and the estimates that you're making. And then the idea is that it'll take this data plus that configuration and spit out a cost to service kind of analysis to go, hey, based on what you told us and the activity in here, this is that raw cost of service, um, you know, this file. And then you could use that as kind of a benchmark for what the gross oh, okay. up, you know, over that. Interesting. The other thing I'd always look at is, um, you know, especially if I was inheriting a set of books from like a DIY CEO is like, you know, what were they in here doing uh, in terms of like the different types of transactions? And and one of the, you know, the richest source of errors, I guess, is, is journal entries in my experience. So you could click in here and say, who was in here making journal entries? And do they look legit, you know, and get all of the line item detail from the ledger itself uh, for each of these different transaction types. So if I wanted to see what are all the expense line items, I could kind of scroll through here you know, get a sense of that I as well. Actually, just reviewed a file. Oh my goodness! Uh, they had done everything in a QuickBooks Online file by journal entry, include <laughs> and like single journal entries, including bank fees. Oh so they're 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 like crediting bank fees, debiting the. I just said that backwards. They're crediting the bank and debiting uh, bank fees. One journal entry, and it's audited financials. And so the auditor wanted. I was doing a review before it was going. They wanted a copy of all the journal entries. And I'm like, no, you don't. No. No, you do not. You do not. So that would be interesting <laughs> to see the volume of journal entries on that file. Yeah. Yeah. I think there must be a forum somewhere for like DIY people that somehow recommends for some reason, like making journal entries to fix issues of QuickBooks, because I see it more often than not, the, the devil's in the journal entries. Um, then undeposited funds. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's usually just like things where it's like, that is not how we do it. And right. it's so cool. here's where I find, find the, uh, this is, this is where the bodies are, uh, open AR, but cleared bank feeds, open AP, but cleared bank feeds, <laughs> uh, cleared bank feeds and a ton of stuff in undeposited funds. Okay. Carry on. Sorry. I think well, that's we actually that. a great segue because whereas we were jump like diving right in, in that first workflow to just find and fix these things, there are situations where, you may not want to dive in and immediately start fixing things. So if I wanted to just look at all the things that were flagged by category, I could come in here. And one of the things that you just mentioned is um, something that I've seen happen a lot where this expense to vendors with bills, for instance, yep. so or checks to vendors oh. with bills. So a situation where you got a vendor who's moving through AP, somebody sees money out and they go, cool, create an expense transaction, charge it straight to the P&L instead of applying it against that, you know, that open bill. 
Um, yep. So what do you got? You got overstated uh, a AP. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Yep. Um, and then the rest of the things that we look for in here are, you know, probably not any giant surprise. They're, they're classic errors like missing data, duplicate data, things parked in suspense accounts, like everybody's favorite uncategorized accounts in, in QBO, at least. Um, the inconsistent codings. You've got a customer name charged to an expense account, just weird kind of patterns like that that you want to double click okay. on. And for each of these, you could click in. And again, see the line item detail from the ledger on like what is what is actually happening at the most granular level there. Vendors, customers, and accounts, as I kind of mentioned, are, are very similar. And it's this idea that I want to get a sense of utilization across these different entities. Like how are they being used? When are they being used? And most importantly, if they're not getting used, can I just turn them off? Because it's just one less thing that me or somebody else on my team can accidentally select when going through and coding, you know, doing the transaction coding. So we'll can, take I, a, can we see it? Yeah, I was going to say, I'd love yep. to see accounts. Yep. Okay, great. So when we come in here and we go to the chart of accounts usage, we could come down to this table. You get the count, get a sense of like what's being used, what's not being used. If we click into the unused, now we've got a list of every uh, account that was not used in this period. And so you could imagine if you throw that period pretty wide, whatever your level of comfort is, some people use a year, some people use two. But you throw that period pretty wide when you run the report and you come in here and go, hey, none of these were actually used in that entire period. Maybe I should just go deactivate them if half my chart of accounts list is not actually even getting used. Um, one of the things that we're uh, going to build in pretty shortly is the ability to just inactivate those things right here. So if you click in here, you'll be able to just either individually inactivate them or bulk inactivate the unused if you, if you have a high confidence level that you could turn them off. Just gonna ask that. Okay. So we're gonna be able to do that right in there and then it'll have that same sync back button, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Okay. The other thing that I use this for is which ones were used and were any created recently by any member of my team without going through the proper channels of like how we actually add charge accounts to charge accounts. I was always very I like to keep it tight and use classes and departments and other things for reporting. And so if we didn't need that account, I wanted to know. So I'd come in here and I'd sort and I'd say, okay, this BOA loan account was created last month. You know, was that actually needed? Seems like it might have been, but I'd go to the person that I know is keeping this file and I'd have a conversation and go, hey, it looks like we added this account. What's up with that? And have a little bit of a conversation about it so that we're not just constantly adding things to the chart of accounts. And then the user activity is um, where you kind of get a sense of, you know, who outside of your organization is in these books. Uh, unfortunately for QuickBooks uh, API access, you, they the audit log itself says yes. who actually did it. The created by, modified by fields that we have access to will just, anybody that's under your QBOA account will just be you. So any of your people would just be called Kelly under here. But given that, I can actually go in here and say, well, I know who on my team is most likely coming in here. And so I could still use this to spot check what they were doing. And then what I always used to just, use this for just is- Just back up that bus a little bit, John, for anybody sure. who doesn't know, the API on the audit log is closed in yes. QuickBooks Online. That Correct. That is not something that Scrutinize has decided not to do. Correct, yes. That yeah. So payroll, uh, payroll and audit trail, um, Right, hard close. Yep, yeah, and the bank feed. And so uh, shameless request, if you feel like going into their support ticket creation engine and, <laughs> and adding another one, they kind of stack rank by the squeakiest wheels. So the more people we have requested, the more likely they are to actually expose it. But um, but yes, no, that's a good that's a good point. It's not really our choice. They just haven't exposed that for us. Um, but then the other thing is like sometimes you're, especially let's say you're a QuickBooks trainer and you're training people up, you could come run your their files and those people aren't added under your QBOA subscription. And so you'll be able to see what they're doing and kind of get in a sense there. Or if you share responsibilities with your clients, like I did with a number of my clients where they would just do the AR or whatever, um, I'd come in here and I'd go, okay, was he in here just doing AR related transaction types or was he in here making journal entries again? <laughs> And then have that conversation of like, why were you making journal entries? You're just supposed to focus on creating invoices and sending them out. Um, 
And so that's kind of like a, a useful kind of uh, sense of like who's doing what in these books. And then the last piece here is, again, what I like to call the sniff test reports. AR aging. Do we have a collections issue? Are there things, you know, I ran this through the end of, of uh, December. We've got things in here since May. Begs the question of, you know, has that actually been received and it was just booked straight to an income account and not applied against that open invoice? Or is this uncollectible? We need to write it down. Or has anybody even picked up the phone and called Red Rock Diner in the last three months to see if they even know that they've got an outstanding, uh, you know, amount that they owe us. So, and then the inverse of that for AP, right? Do I have a payments issue? Is there some kind of application issue or is it actually like more of a cash flow thing that I need to be wary of and, and make sure that my clients are, um, you know, managing their cash more effectively. And then once we've done all that kind of fine tooth combing- Can I see the balance sheet variance? Boom. This is, this is what I call like the top-down analysis, top-down sniff test. So balance sheet variance, P&L variance here. You could scroll, you know, we've got a whole year of data in here. So it's it's quite a bit of a scroll here, but you could- Frozen column, you've got your frozen column. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we froze the column. And actually this week we're adding um, um, the ability to, it's still not live, we're in staging, but the ability to click in and actually see the, uh, oh, I broke it. See the actual detail underneath. So if, so let's say you're scrolling and you see, wow, there's an 855% increase you know, in the current period. You'll be able to click right in and see the ledger detail in that account for that period to assess. Again, usually it's somebody booking something to the straight to the income account that should have you know, been accrued or something like that. But um, you'll be able to get that at level of, of granularity and, and drillability, if you will, on these reports. You are iterating this product like crazy right now, right? Correct. Yep. So, so I think it's not going to look exactly like that coming up. So Is, one of the things so that let's we're date doing... stamp. Oh, you know what we did not do at the beginning, but uh -oh. you know, YouTube will. We did not date stamp this video. So it's February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day, John. Likewise. Uh 2023. So yeah, yep. but yep, so we're gonna date stamp it right here because you're iterating on your product. I mean, aside from what you just said about going directly uh drilling down on transactions in the balance sheet and yada yada, what what's gonna look different or what's gonna feel different in there? Yeah, I'd say there's a lot of minor improvements and and adding some of that drillability and some of that, you know, features around inactivating accounts. The largest change that we're making right now is really wrapping more of a directed workflow experience around going through these different data elements that I just showed you. So the individual interactions and the elements that I showed you and that data won't change so much. But what we'll do is we'll have a uh, basically a step, you know, in, in kind of re-orchestrating re the navigation elements here, but a step where you'll select a client, you'll select a period, and then you'll select a work, what we call a workflow. And so you'll kind of say, what am I doing? Am I doing a scope of work? Am I doing a month end review? Am I doing just a general quality review? And then based off of that, we'll kind of walk you through each step uh, in a much more, I think, thoughtful experience instead of kind of landing in and then just clicking around the various data elements. It'll say like, first review this, this is what you're looking for. This is the element. Okay, I'm done with that. There's two kind of angles of that and why, why we decided to make these changes. The first is for the actual user experience of the person that's going to be using this most often. It's kind of like a nice little almost narrowing or a little tunnel visioning of like, what am I doing specifically with this data, you know, right here, right now, and not kind of overwhelming you potentially with all the other options to go click around right off the bat. The other thing that that allows us to do then is build more of like a firm dashboard kind of level so that managers or directors or executives, whoever partners can log in and say, hey, what's the state of these quality reviews across all these clients, across my teams? Okay, um, and so you'll get a little bit more of that kind of like, you know, where, where's the what, which way the wind's blowing in terms of where we're at um, in these quality reviews and, and what's left to be done. So. Um because you filled out the form. I know that Zapier is Zapier, Zapier because it makes you happier is on your roadmap. Make not yet because a lot of people pick off Zapier first, right? 
what yeah. what would what would you do with Zapier and Scrutinize? I think the great thing about Zapier is that you know, in terms of the interactions that you could imagine inside of Scrutinize, it could be like automatically running those reports. So let's say, let's give you an example. Um, you're in Carbon, you know, you've got your task list for all the other things that you do for this client in Carbon. We could set it up where it's like, once you've selected that you've completed task A and where task B or the next task is, go do the review and scrutinize. We could actually have a trigger that just automatically goes and runs that report for whatever that period is in scrutinize. So it's just already ready for you there. The inverse is also true. There are situations where we talk to people that say, hey, I actually want to create like more of a custom ticketing engine and assign out these tasks in carbon based off of things that are happening or remediation that's required inside of um, uh, scrutinize based on what it finds. And so you can imagine a world where it automatically runs the report, the report gets done, and then it automatically creates some tasks to go say, hey, Dave, or Tina, or whoever, go double click on these transactions in your client file because you know XYZ you know, is potentially wrong with them. Um, so we're starting with Zapier because of that one to many, there are so many different apps that you can interact with on the other side. So we build out those triggers and actions, you know, as far as interacting with our app and then wherever they want it to go, uh, it can go. And so it's a, it's kind of a high leverage integration from that aspect. Uh, for sure. Uh, any final thoughts that you want to share things you want us to know about? Us being, this is going to go into the workflow watering hole and yeah. on my YouTube, um, yay YouTube, but <laughs> any, any other final thoughts on you what know, we just, should know? I, I would just say, I would just kind of like leave with this idea that like we, we are, uh, as you mentioned, constantly iterating on this product and ultimately it doesn't need to just work for us or the way we want it to work. It needs to work for everybody else. So one of the things we actually love is raw you know, unfiltered feedback uh, from our users. So if you do sign up um, and, you're, and you're going through a trial period or you're using the app in whatever way and you have feedback, uh, we have multiple different ways that you can um, either go through Freshdesk and create kind of more ticketed uh, or you'll have like a direct link to our, uh, our support team as well through email where you can send that feedback. And uh, we take that very seriously. We stack rank it and we go, okay, 10 people just said this. We need to prioritize this in our, on our roadmap. So- we're still in that very um, flexible phase of our product life cycle where we can iterate and develop things that are helpful to you quicker than maybe some of the, the larger players. So. And you are, I believe, setting up an advisory council or you're hoping to do something where the product feedback is more succinct with people maybe having a discussion together about it and Correct. noodling through some ideas. Is that Did I get that out of that? Yeah, I was I was really inspired by Twyla uh, at FreshBooks Who in particular. Huh? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Who isn't um, inspired by Twyla? So we'll have yeah. to uh, you will have to do an at Twyla yeah. shout out here. Yeah. Um, but I ha you know, I had a couple conversations with her around the community that she's developed um, and the, the sort of partner council. I can't remember the, the exact terminology, but around that product, it's, it's the it's the uh, advi uh, accountants advisory council. Advisory I should know. Council. Uh, uh, I until very recently I was on it. I'm alumni now. Um, okay, so yeah, you were talking to Twyla about that, which has been fantastic. Yeah, it's just it, it really kind of like made me. It kind of lit the fire under me, so to speak, to be like, okay, we need to prioritize uh, getting that together. Not only, as she said, from people that love your app, but also people that don't, and maybe people that don't even use it. Um, and so we're really trying to cast that net pretty wide and get. Uh, you know, highly opinionated people that want to come together and kind of collaborate to help make this tool better uh, over time uh, so that we're not sort of building in a vacuum. Okay, cool. And um, I have one last question. And then if you have any final thoughts, that's cool too. Um, where are you going to be? Uh, are, I, I know some of your marketing channels are on social and, but I think I've, I've seen you now at, I think, Three events now. I've met you in real life. Yep, three. And counting. so three. Yep. Uh, what's coming up for you in 2023? Where will they see either John or Scrutinize represented? Yep. So we're planning on going to like all the the, the bigger names. So scaling new heights. Uh, unfortunately, Accounting Web isn't you know going to happen again. But uh, scaling new That's heights. Um, yeah, ZeroCon, QuickBooks uh, Connect, like all 
all of the big events uh, will be there at some in some capacity, uh, representing either you know maybe we'll have a booth, maybe we'll wear what I call mobile signage, which is just my scrutinized T-shirt, <laughs> walking around talking to people. Um, and then on social channels, you can find me. I know you hate LinkedIn, but I you know we are on LinkedIn. We're on Twitter. Uh, we're building up our what Facebook presence. LinkedIn. And by the way, don't call me out on that. Oh, you sorry. Is put, that... I'm pointing right, making point that you put yuck on LinkedIn on the form you filled out too. <laughs> You're not a bigger fan of LinkedIn than I. It's so funny. LinkedIn is where you have to have a presence to show that you legitimately exist, yet it is the number one place to get spammed. Like it, the it dichotomy is. of that is so odd. Yeah. It's sort of like the, if you don't have a LinkedIn, it's noticed, but the most rich engagements that I've ever had with people, probably including yourself are in Twitter DMs. So it's, so it's kind of like a weird thing where like on LinkedIn, everybody's kind of like, yes, we're, we are a business. And then on Twitter, it's just sort of like, yo, what's up with this? You know, like people can kind of let the guard down. It's a lot more personable and human. So LinkedIn, I'm always afraid to any kind of, I think they're called connections because I, I know I'm going to get inbox. Hey, Kelly, I, or not even your name, right? Just like, I see that you are a, no, I'm not. Yeah. Like that's where you just get spam. Anyways, carry on. Any final thoughts that you want to get out there before we end this recording? No, I think, I think that was it. Just that like, we, we love any and all kind of feedback. So um, if you have questions about, you know, um, the app before you want to start a trial, or let's say you start a trial and you want to schedule some time with me to kind of walk through maybe like a live scenario with um, some of your calendly. Yep. I got, I got a calendly link and uh, we'll be happy to share that as well. Um, it's so. to the workflow watering hall. It is a uh, Facebook group, but it's a fun Facebook group all about apps and technology and workflows and processes and automations and systems and you have had the elephant behind you in the workflow watering hole the whole premise is that we are elephants and we're helping each other and it's a sense of community and our our, our header is actually a bunch of elephants at the watering hole so that's fun that I know you didn't put that up there on purpose because of the watering hole but thank you no I, I that's my favorite animal so it's like yeah okay. so we'll see you in the watering hole sounds great thanks Kelly okay Stop. Bye.